and welcome to the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center webinar covering forensic DNA analysis. My name is Steve Rutterfer, and I'm the director of the HDIAC, and we have the privilege of hosting Dr. Ellen Graytech for today's presentation. This is our third webinar this month, and I'm grateful to everyone who's taking time out to join during these challenging times. I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center. The DTIC IAC mission is to collect, synthesize, produce, and disseminate scientific and technical information to the DOD and federal government users, and this webinar is made possible through DTIC sponsorship. So I'll go over a few housekeeping notes as we kick off today. Please note that all lines have been muted. So if you have a question during the webinar, please submit it using the attendee chat box on the left-hand side of the screen. And we'll work to save the last 10 minutes or so of this presentation to go over those questions and discuss them. If we should run out of time or the presentation runs long, we'll make note of any questions that have not been answered and we'll post responses after the conclusion of the brief. Please also know that this webinar is being recorded. A link for the recording as well as the slides will be available at our website, www.hdiac.org for later download. With that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to today's presenter, Dr. Ellen Graytech. Dr. Graytech is the Director of Bioinformatics and leads Parabon Snapshot DNA Analysis Division, which provides genetic genealogy, DNA phenotyping, and kinship inference services to law enforcement and military agencies around the world. Ellen has her doctorate from Harvard University in the field of organismic and evolutionary biology, and she is co-creator of Parabon Snapshot Kinship Inference Technology, which provides highly accurate inferences about familiar relationships between two people based on their DNA, even if they are distantly related. Dr. Graytech is also one of the creators of the Snapshot DNA Phenotyping Technology, the world's first software application able to predict the ancestry and physical traits including face shape of an unknown person from simply a DNA sample. Ellen is responsible for creating the underlying predictive models for DNA phenotyping and building the customized bioinformatics pipelines that combine various genetic analysis tools with machine learning. She directed Parabon's software team in the creation of an evolutionary search algorithm to automatically optimize machine learning parameters. Recognized as an expert in the field of DNA phenotyping, Dr. Graytech has delivered many lectures on DNA phenotyping and kinship inference at forensics, genetics, and law enforcement conferences. It is our distinct pleasure to host Dr. Graytech today. With that, the floor is yours, Ellen. Thank you, Steve, and thank you to the organizers and HDIX. This is a really great opportunity, and I'm excited to speak to everybody. Uh, the organizers asked me to get into the nerdy stuff, but we've also got a lot to cover, so hopefully we'll find a good balance here. So I'm going to be going through a, a lot of different types of forensic analyses and how they work, uh, and feel free to submit those questions for the end. So in traditional forensic DNA analysis, there's DNA that's collected at a crime scene. You know, that could be a swab from a murder weapon or from a victim. It could be bone from unidentified remains. DNA is extracted from that and used to produce a DNA fingerprint, which is a short tandem repeat or STR profile. So that's looking at about 20 different spots in the DNA and just measuring how long they are. So this is great for answering identity questions. So is this unknown person someone who's already been convicted of a crime and is in a database? Or is this one of the suspects who have already been identified? It's great for definitively establishing the identity of someone just through that direct matching. Where Parabon comes in is when there are no matches, when that person is not in a database or it's not one of the suspects who's already been identified. And so instead, we're taking that same DNA and trying to analyze it in a different way. So instead of producing that DNA fingerprint, just measuring the length of 20 spots in the genome, instead we're measuring the genotype, the single nucleotide polymorphism or SNP genotype of about a million spots in the genome. So instead of measuring the length, we're actually asking what are the nucleotides there? Is this person CC or CT or GG, so on. And using that information, since we're generating more information and a different type of information, we can use it in different ways. And we can actually generate new leads 
from the DNA, answering questions like, what does this unknown person look like? Is this person related to someone we do know? Uh, we can do genetic genealogy. And all of this is designed to generate leads. It's not intended to establish identity. Those, those traditional methods are already great for that. Our goal is to help detectives figure out who they should and shouldn't be looking for. You know, who are the suspects who they should be testing to see who matches uh, and who should they not be. And so that's what the goal is here. And we're not trying to innovate on the identity side. We've done most of this work in collaboration with the Department of Defense and with funding from the Department of Defense. This all started about 10 years ago with a phase one SBIR from DITRA for DNA phenotyping. And that has since spun out into a phase two, a sequential phase two, a modification, a, a, enhance, a phase two enhancement. Uh, so really a lot has followed on from that original work because it's been so successful. So first it spun out into kinship analysis, first as, a, as an SBIR modification and then as another a new contract. Genetic genealogy is not directly funded by the DOD, but it wouldn't be possible without all the work that went into developing the phenotyping and kinship projects. So really that is now possible because of the DOD. And then the last project that we're working on right now for forensics is next generation sequencing analysis, which is another contract. Uh, and we still have lots of other projects too, but these are the ones I'm going to focus on. Uh, and these have been very successful. I mean, the goal of the SBIR program is both to uh, help small businesses develop new uh, new technologies that's useful that are useful to the DOD, and also to help those businesses commercialize the, those technologies in other domains. So we've been very successful with this, with commercializing DNA phenotyping. What we originally called snapshot was just DNA phenotyping. Now snapshot is the whole whole package, phenotyping, kinship, and genetic genealogy, and all of that is being offered to law enforcement. It's been extremely successful. We've worked on a hundred on hundreds of cases and have helped solve, as of today, I think 111 uh, in the last two years. Uh, and the other, uh, and the kinship analysis and the NGS analysis are also um, transitioning to the DOD forensics labs. I'm gonna start with DNA phenotyping because this is where it all started. So DNA, DNA phenotyping was originally designed to help the DOD with the problem of, you know, in theaters of war, there may not be a DNA database that's available for comparisons. And so DITRA put out a, an SBIR solicitation saying, you know, if we collect a DNA sample from an unexploded IED, we would like to be able to predict the appearance of the person who planted that IED. And so companies proposed different solutions and Paramount ended up being one of several companies who won phase one and then winning the phase two. And that's at the point that they brought me in to lead the development. So the first thing we want to do is determine the ancestry of our unknown person. We've collected their, their DNA and we'd like to know, is this person European? Are they Asian? Are they African? And not just that, but also are they Northern European or Eastern or Southern European? So to do that, started by collecting um, thousands and thousands of research subjects from all over the world. So these are not, this is not just going out into the US and asking people where they think they're from, but actually going to each of these parts of the world and collecting people who all four of their grandparents are from that same place so that their DNA is representative of that part of the world. Unfortunately, I didn't get to do that, all of that sampling. This is all from research papers that have been published, but um, the goal is really to collect a worldwide sampling of DNA so that we can then take a new person's DNA and sort of match it to where it most likely came from. So to do that, we're using tens of thousands of SNPs across the genome. And our goal is to get a precise estimate of ancestry. So not just European, but can we localize that within Europe? And can we do that even if that person is not just European? What if they're partly Asian? Or even what if that person is from, say, Kazakhstan, a place that's not clearly Europe or Asia, but is sort of in between. We want to be able to pick that up. So this is what that looks like. This is an individual who was sent to us during a blind evaluation test. So this was a, a major metropolitan 
Metropolitan Police Department that very early on wanted us to prove that Snapchat worked, that we could really tell them useful information just based on DNA before they sent us any you know, precious actual crime scene evidence. So we analyzed this DNA from this guy who all we knew about him was that his name was Genome 8. And we found that he was about 50% East Asian, a quarter Native American, and the other quarter, a mix of European, Middle Eastern, and African. So this is not ancestry that we had ever seen before. We had no one in our database with this mix of ancestries. But because of the approach that we take, we were able to pick up all of these different populations and then get even more specific that the East Asian ancestry was J Japanese, the American ancestry was mostly Central American, and the European ancestry was mostly Southwest European. So half of the DNA was Japanese and half was a mix of Central American and Spanish or Portuguese, which is sort of the signature of Latino ancestry. We then looked at this guy's Y chromosome and it looked like an East Asian Y chromosome. So from that, we were able to tell this agency, well, if this were a suspect in a crime, you would be looking for someone who most likely has a Japanese father and a Central American Latino mother. And they said, that's correct. His father's from Japan and his mother is from Mexico. So that's ancestry. The next question we have is what is this person's pigmentation? Can we tell detectives what their eye color, hair color, skin color is? So in order to do that, we need to pick out the SNPs that are associated with a particular trait. So we know that traits like eye color are heritable. They're passed down through the DNA, passed down through families. When someone tells you, oh, you have your mother's eyes, well, that's because you have your mother's DNA. And the goal is to now to find out what are the SNPs determining people's eye colors. So the vast majority of your DNA has nothing to do with your eye color. It's only a few genes. And so we wanna pick those out. And the way we do that is using what we call a genotype plus phenotype or G plus P database, where we have here in this example, 3000 subjects where we know their eye colors. You know, is there, are their eyes blue or green or brown? And we also have their SNP genotypes at about a million SNPs. So we then can look at each of those SNPs and ask how does this, or does this SNP correlate with this phenotype? So SNP three here, the people who have a GG genotype tend to have lighter eyes. So that would be a statistical association for eye color, but a different trait is of course going to have different associations. You know, if we swapped out eye color for something different then SNP two might associate. So we do that across all 1 million SNPs and we find that as we expected, most of the DNA has nothing to do with eye color, but then we find you know, these, these very, very strong signals of genes that do determine eye color. And actually, I mean, eye color is, is particularly straightforward in that there's basically one SNP that determines about 90% of your eye color. Uh, and then there are others that modify it, but uh, you can get a long way with just that, that magenta peak there. But of course, things are never as simple as we'd like them to be. And many traits are affected not just by how single SNPs correlate with a phenotype, but how SNPs interact with one another. So you have one genotype and that affects how a different genotype behaves. But if we're interested in looking at interactions among three, four, five SNPs among a million, well, we're basically going to spend until the heat death of the universe doing calculations, which isn't going to get us very far. So we developed a software, this was with NIH funding, called Crush MDR that uses an evolutionary search algorithm. The idea being we know we're not going to do 10 to the 27th calculations, but can we do you know, a few billion maybe, uh, a few billion calculations and try to get the most interesting results that we can. You know, th this set of SNPs is looking promising. Well, let's swap in a different one or add another one and see if it does better and we can evolve towards interesting solutions. And this allows us to pick up interactions that nobody's been able to find before. And we're doing this not just for forensics, but we also have a project with NIH to do this similar work for Alzheimer's disease, trying to better understand the genes that can predict 
that trait. So once we selected the SNPs that we think are involved in a trait, then need to build a predictive model. So we call this genotype to phenotype or G2P modeling. We've chosen to do this using machine learning, supervised machine learning. So what that means is we take that G plus B database of all those subjects where we have their genotypes and their phenotypes, we cut it down to the SNPs that were interesting and use those plus any covariates we have like ancestry or sex and let a machine learning algorithm add it to learn how to predict that outcome, so eye color, from those features, from those SNPs. So at the bottom is a little figure where we plug our data into this learning algorithm and out pops a model. And that model is just basically a mathematical function that if you plug in a set of data, so in this case, this would be new data from an unknown person, we can plug that into that model and get a prediction of that trait. And then we need to test whether this is accurate. We want to know, you know, if I'm if I plug in data from a crime scene sample and get a prediction, is it actually going to be correct? Because if it's not, then we don't want to use this model. The way we do that is using something called cross-validation. So if we have our 3,000 subjects for eye color, we set aside 10% of them as a testing set. We're only going to work with the training set. So we do that entire process of selecting the SNPs and building that model, and then use the model to make predictions on the testing set. So this model has never seen those subjects before. They were not used to select the SNPs. They were not used to build the model. They are new to this model. So these predictions represent what we would see in a real forensic case. And then we can compare, we can reveal the true result, true uh, phenotype values and calculate how accurate we were. We then have to do that 10 times for each fold or so for each 10% uh, of the data. But in the end, we've now made, uh oh, did we lose my slides? Ooh. Okay, then we're, we're performing the data mining and predictive modeling 10 times for each phenotype. But at the end, we've now made predictions on 3,000 people. And we know exactly how accurate this, uh, how accurate this uh, model is in people with different traits. So we know when we make a prediction on someone with blue eyes, what that prediction looks like versus someone with brown eyes. And we can actually use that to make confidence statements when we make a new prediction and even exclude categories that are extremely unlikely. So that can be very, very valuable for law enforcement. You can understand how that would work with something like eye color, where we can very clearly say, you know, this person has blue eyes and that person has brown eyes. But for something much more complex, like face morphology, it gets a little more complicated. You know, we can't just say someone, you know, give a single number to explain someone's face shape. Instead, we need to capture the 3D shape of their face. And so this has traditionally been something that's been done with a very expensive and fragile 3D camera. But as part of our phase two SBIR enhancement, we're developing a smartphone app that you basically just take a video of yourself turning your face from left to right and up and down. And it can, from that, build a 3D model of your face. And so starting next week, we'll actually be recruiting subjects for a study to expand our, our face model database and, and do more modeling, which is pretty exciting. So, and, and don't worry, we now uh, do not need the little skull cap, like you can see that I'm wearing in these screenshots of me doing this, uh, doing this app. But on the right, I mean, what's important is that we're getting a good 3D reconstruction of my face just from a simple smartphone video. And of course, we then need to quantify a face shape, which means placing, so basically turning that 3D shape into a cluster of points, each of which has an XYZ coordinate. And now we can directly compare faces. You know, the XYZ coordinate of this person's nose is different from this other person's nose because they have differently shaped noses. But we still have tens of thousands of variables now that are defining each face, which given all we had to go through just to make a model for eye color, we do not want to be making tens of thousands of models. So instead we can use principal component analysis to reduce the size of that variable space 
And basically what this does is it looks for variables that are correlated with one another and turns them into new variables that capture a lot of the variation in a smaller number of variables. So this is what that looks like. This is what we call face space. I'm gonna be showing you the first five principal components of face space. So this just comes right out of the data. But if we ask principal component analysis, what is the largest axis of variation among faces? What it finds is it's basically going from a very short round feminine face to a long narrow masculine face. And so this is only capturing maybe 20 to 30% of the variation in faces, but everybody's face is somewhere along this dimension. And, you, and it's numerical, so that very feminine face might be a plus five, the very masculine face might be a minus five. You know, my face is long and narrow, so maybe I'm at a minus two or something like that. And as we add more and more dimensions, we're getting more and more specific about the shape of the face. So this next one covers the, the shape of the jaw and the mouth and the nose and the chin. And as we add each and each dimension, we can get more and more specific about the shape of that face. And we just need to predict what is this unknown person's value along each of these dimensions. So now we built all of our models and we wanna make predictions on new subjects. So this is where things get scary. You know, we've been able thus far to, to check how we're doing. We make a prediction and then we can look up whether we got it right. But when you're making predictions on people who you don't know the true answers for, you need to be very confident in your results. And that's why we've tested this on thousands of people. All right, so we plug in DNA from an unknown person. And the first thing Snapshot can tell us is this person's European and primarily Northern European. Then with the pigmentation predictions, all that comes out is a number. You know, this person's eye color is 1.56, which by itself is not very valuable, but we have those cross-validation results. We've made predictions on a thousand people with blue eyes and a thousand people with brown eyes. And we can look this plot on the right showing that a 1.56, well, that's pretty common for people who have blue or green eyes but it's extremely uncommon for people who have brown or black eyes. So we can use that to then tell detectives, hey, it's very unlikely that this DNA came from someone with brown or black eyes. It's not impossible. There's still a 0.7% chance, but it's very unlikely. So if that detective has a suspect list and needs to decide who to talk to, anyone with dark eyes, they wouldn't be eliminated entirely, but they would be moved to the bottom. And anyone with hazel eyes would sort of be in the middle, and anyone with blue or green would move to the top. We can then do that for each trait. You know, this person has very fair skin, blonde hair, a few freckles, and a long, narrow face. So all of this is what comes out of Snapshot, a 3D face shape plus all of those pigmentation predictions. At this point, this gets handed over to a forensic artist. So we have that 3D face shape, but then we need to put skin, eyes, hair, and freckles on it. So our forensic artist has a spectrum where you can look and say, okay, this eye color prediction, I you know, follow this tree and that tells me I put on medium blue eyes and I put on medium blonde hair and some freckles on the nose. And this creates a composite, but this composite is a prediction. It is not intended to be a photograph of the person because we only have access to the DNA. We're only looking at the SNPs. That person's age and their weight are not written in their SNPs. So by default, we always make a prediction as a young adult at a normal body weight. We also can't know anything that's not genetic, how that person wears their hair, whether they have a face tattoo or scars or face, you know, facial hair, things like that, we cannot predict. And we never claim that we could because it's, it's not possible. But what we have here is something is a composite that should strongly resemble that person if they were a young adult at a normal body weight. And our forensic artists can then take these and age progress them if you know many of the cases that we work are 30, 40, 50 years old. Well, that person certainly isn't 25 now. So our artist can then age progress it. But that is the goal of this, is to provide a, a summary and a composite that detectives can then use to generate leads and narrow down their suspect lists. So what does that actually look like in law enforcement? 
So we, when we built those models, those predictive models were built using really nice, high quality data from research volunteers. And so those models are assuming that they're getting nice, high quality data. But in forensics, we often don't have that. The DNA can be a varying quality and quantity, and we need to be able to take that into account. So this table here is, is a table from uh, a paper uh, that I came out with last year in Forensic Science International showing the first 250 samples that we had analyzed for snapshot. You can see that we're working with all different types of, of uh, samples, you know, even, even bone, uh, and we work with both single source and mixed samples as well, uh, and, and low quality, low quantity DNA. So the assay that we use called microarray genotyping, the manufacturers recommend using 200 nanograms of DNA, but we've shown that using one nanogram of DNA, you can still do pretty darn well. Um, and on the right is the call rate. So of the SNPs that we targeted, how many succeeded? So most of the time we are getting really good data, but it's still not perfect data. So since the data is never going to be perfect, first of all, we had to make sure that we used a machine learning algorithm that would allow for missing data. So many of them don't. If you don't have one of your features, it can't make a prediction. We also need to make sure that our confidence statements are appropriate. So those uh, that cross-validation I showed you, well, that was done assuming we had all of the SNPs for the, each sample. And now we're making a prediction on this forensic casework sample that's missing some of those SNPs. Well, now those confidence intervals are not appropriate. So instead, we actually recalculate the cross-validation intervals each time, assuming we only had the SNPs that were available in that given sample. So when we make our confidence statements, they're apples to apples. We've had to innovate on the laboratory side. So we have an optimized protocol that our labs use uh, to type forensic samples that's a little different from the standard protocol for something like a you know saliva swab. And we had to invent a new computational method to deal with mixtures. So we were getting a lot of sexual assault samples that had DNA from both the perpetrator and the victim. And we needed to be able to remove computationally the signal from the victim so that we were only analyzing the perpetrator. And so we've been we've used that now in dozens of cases, many of which have been solved. So we've worked on hundreds of cases, and every single case that has ever gone public with their phenotyping results is on our website. And if that person was later identified and their DNA was matched, we put their photo on there so you, you can go compare and see how you think we've been doing. So just a couple case studies for how law enforcement uses this information. So this was a homicide in 1992 of a young woman in Massachusetts, and the detectives were reopening this case. I think this was around 2016, they were reopening this case. And, you know, there were thousands of people who over those decades had been, you know, noted in the case file. Most of them had not been excluded using DNA. And so these detectives were saying, okay, so where do we start? So they used the DNA phenotyping results to prioritize who to talk to. I think there were maybe five guys who closely matched the predictions that we made. So they said, okay, well, we've got to start somewhere. Let's go knock on their doors. One of them, uh, they knock on his door. He's not home, but they tell his roommate, you know, when, when Gary gets home, just let him know we'd, we'd like to speak with him. When Gary hears that, he flees and is eventually the cops are able to track him down and match his DNA to that crime scene sample. And he has confessed. So after 25 years, they were finally able to close this homicide case. Uh, another, this was a homicide in 2009 of a young woman in Louisiana. And based on her cell phone record, you know, all the people that she had been talking to that night and who they figured she had gone to meet up with were Hispanic males. And so that's who they had been looking for for six years. We analyzed the DNA from the crime scene and it, so this is a Northern European guy with blue eyes. And so the detectives were sort of baffled at first, like, well, we haven't been thinking about that. We haven't been looking in that direction. And so they decided to release the composite publicly. 
And I actually only recently learned all the details of this because Forensic Files did an episode on this case. But apparently this guy saw the information that we released and called up his ex and said, uh, so just remember, I was with you that night. <laughs> and she said, oh, I do remember and you weren't with me. So she called in a tip and you know, detectives investigated him and were eventually able to match his DNA to that crime scene sample. So something that then spun out of the DNA phenotyping work was distant kinship inference. So some folks at the DOD were saying, you know, well, phenotyping seems neat, but it's not always going to be useful in some of the theaters that we're working in, you know, just knowing someone's eye color, or hair color, that might not really help us distinguish. But many of the groups that we're working against have a familial connection. And so we have that sample from an IED and it's not matching anyone we know, but could it be a cousin, a second cousin of someone we know? And so there were, we modified the SBIR to add a new task that given to DNA from two subjects, could we determine their degree of relatedness? So we built new models. And now instead of a single genome trying to figure out what the eye color is, we have a pair of genomes and we're trying to predict their relationship. So we did it the same way, except our G plus P database, instead of individual SNP genotypes is now metrics of DNA sharing between related people. And so we ended up recruiting a few hundred people for a research study. It was pretty great. We got out to like six cousins um, and we're able to build these predictive models and including families with people of different ethnic backgrounds, which, you know, it seems, oh, what does that mean? But you know, sometimes a family is mostly Northern European, but at some point someone marries someone from a different ethnic background and their children uh, have ad admixed ancestry. Well, they're still related. We still need to be able to pick up that they're, you know, cousins at a particular degree, which I don't think is something that had really been thought about much before. And so we found that this approach was extremely accurate. Uh, most importantly, we were able to distinguish unrelated pairs from even sixth degree relatives with very high accuracy. And so we would be able to tell you, well, is your perpetrator related to your victim or to someone else that you do know if we have DNA from both people. But this still requires high quality data from tens of thousands of SNPs. And so there was some interest in these technologies for the DOD's past accounting mission. So this is a mission to identify missing soldiers from past conflicts and these days, that's mostly by matching their DNA to family references. So there's been some amazing work to push forward the science to, to make this possible, but the DOD had a problem that not all missing soldiers can be matched to their, to their available family references using the techniques that they had at their disposal. So we entered into a collaboration with AFTL to uh, take these autosomal kinship te techniques that we had just that we had created and adapt them to work with very highly degraded DNA. So these are samples where there is no chance of doing a microarray uh, and instead we're going to need new ways to generate data and to analyze really difficult data. So we innovated both on the laboratory side, so AFTL has implemented some really cool new techniques to get thousands and maybe even tens of thousands of autosomal SNPs from these very highly degraded bone samples. I mean, these are, you know, going back to World War II, or they've been, I mean, they, they deal with the most difficult samples, like more difficult than the Neanderthal samples. It's pretty amazing the work that they do. And we've also had to innovate on the bioinformatics side where we've got you know, a family reference with nice, good data. We have genotypes at all of their SNPs, but then our unidentified person, most of the SNPs are missing. And the ones that we do have, most of them may only have one allele. We only have one read and we can only uh, know that maybe they share one allele. We can't tell more than that, but we still need, need to be able to say, is this bone from the great uncle of this family reference? So in a blind test, we've been able to match samples from as far back as World War II to their family references. And so we're working on transitioning that to AFTL and hoping that that will help them uh, make more identifications once they've validated it and brought it into their casework division. 
So out of all of this work arose genetic genealogy. So when we were recruiting subjects for our kinship study, uh, this came to the attention of C.C. Moore, who was a genetic genealogist helping you know, adoptees, people like that, refugees, children of donors, find their biological families. And she was saying, you know, the techniques that she had come up with to do that could help solve law enforcement cases. It's the same techniques. We have DNA and we need to put an identity on it. Parabon, we had the connections with law enforcement, the ability to generate good data. We thought maybe we could work together. And it's a good thing we did. So back in uh, May of 2018, uh, we first launched this genetic genealogy part of Snapshot using the um, CC's work and the people that she has recruited to work with us. And we have helped solve uh, over 2,500 years of cold case investigations in the last two years. It's been really amazing. So genetic genealogy, you've probably been hearing a lot about it. So I'll go through how it works. Well, step one is just to generate data. We've already done that. So fortunately, it's the same data that we need for phenotyping. So we just need one sample. We could do phenotyping, kinship, or genetic genealogy, or all three on that same data. Then instead of making predictions, going to upload that data to a genetic genealogy database to try to find other individuals who share DNA with our unknown person. So this unknown person is a perpetrator and it could be, or could be unidentified remains. And what we're looking for is shared DNA. So from, um, so what does shared DNA actually mean? So when a, uh, a child inherits DNA from their parents, they inherit one copy of each chromosome from their father and one copy from their mother. So what that looks like is the father has these red and brown chromosomes, doesn't pass, on, pass them on intact, they recombine, and that child then inherits a random combination of those two chromosomes. And same with the mother, the green and blue chromosomes recombine, and that child inherits that mixed up DNA. Then this process happens randomly. So if those parents then have another child, recombination happens in different places. And that second child is now full siblings to the first one, has inherited a different random combination of their parents' DNA. And of course, this is only showing one chromosome, but this would happen across all the chromosomes. So now if we look at those two full siblings, child one and child two, they share that green segment of DNA at the top, the red segment in the middle, and that blue segment at the bottom. And in between, they don't share DNA. They just happen to inherit different pieces of DNA in those other spots. But across most of that chromosome, they share DNA with each other. But if we go down another generation, child one and child two, they each marry someone, have children. Well, child one passes on a random combination of those chromosomes that they inherited from their parents onto their child. And child two does the same thing. So now we have grandchild one and grandchild two who are first cousins to one another. And we see that they now just share that red segment and that blue segment. And so they're basically sharing less DNA because they are more distantly related. The common ancestor from whom they inherited that DNA is further back in the past. So how do we actually find those pieces of shared DNA? I mean, that's what's happening biologically, but all we have is the data and we need to say, do these two people share a shared segment of DNA? So we can't just look at individual SNPs. So any given SNP only has two possible alleles. So let's say it's A and G. So that means each person can either be AA, AG, or GG. So if you look at any two random people, chances are at most SNPs, they might share one or two alleles. It's just going to happen that way. So we need to look for a signature that's not going to be common in two random people. So if we look down at the bottom here, there's subject one and subject two. At this first SNP, uh, subject one is AA and subject two is GG. So they don't share any DNA at that SNP. But at the next one, subject one is AG, subject two is AA. 
which means they share an A. At the next SNP, they both have a T. And if we keep looking along that chromosome and we have 500 SNPs in a row where they share at least one allele, well, odds are that that didn't happen by chance. Instead, that, most like, that piece of DNA was most likely inherited from a common ancestor. And so if we add that all up across the whole genome, we find that the amount of shared DNA correlates with relatedness. So at the top of this plot, we have parent child and full siblings sharing lots and lots of DNA. Then we have first cousins sharing less, second cousins sharing less. So you see that as we go down, the amount of shared DNA decreases and those distributions get wider because we've had more recombination events and recombination is random. So we're going to see a wider range of possible DNA sharing. But overall, closer relatives share more DNA. All right, so I mentioned uploading to a database. Well, we need to be a database that actually allows law enforcement to use it. There are only two of those, GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA. They both have rules that they can only be used for unidentified remains or for violent crimes. And they both have the ability for users to choose whether to be opted in or opted out of law enforcement matching. The big guys, 23andMe, Ancestry, MyHeritage, they are not available for law enforcement usage. All right, so when we've uploaded DNA from our unknown person, the database, so let's say GEDmatch, compares that file to all the opted in users and says, how much DNA do they share? How many of those shared segments are they? And we, Paragon, we only see the amount and location of shared DNA, not the DNA itself. So right here, this is my DNA uploaded to GEDmatch. I found a cousin I didn't know about and we share about 70 centimorgans of DNA. But that's all I can learn about her. You know, I can't then go look at her DNA and say, oh, she's got a gene for this disease or anything like that. We have no access to the DNA of the matches. So now we've found people in the database who share DNA with our unknown person and we know how much DNA they share. And so like I mentioned, what we're then looking for is that there's somewhere back in the past, a common ancestor from whom our unknown person and that person in the database inherited that DNA. So we need to build family trees back in time to those common ancestors. And this is just using public records. So if you get a subscription to you know, ancestry.com, you can access newspapers, census records, state, um, state birth indexes, all of these things are public records. And so we have a certain amount of shared DNA. Let's say we find someone in the database who shares 300 centimorgans. We would be very excited because that's a lot of DNA, uh, but it definitely simplifies things the closer two people are. We then look at that chart. We see that 300 centimorgans is right where that red arrow is. Well, that's most likely a fifth degree relationship. Could be fourth degree, could be sixth degree, but it's most likely fifth degree. We can then look at the possible relationships that are consistent with fifth degrees. We have our suspect there in red. All those dark blue relationships are possible fifth degree relatives. This isn't even showing half relationships. So, you know, there are a lot of possible relationships that this could be, but we're still getting closer than we were. And when we started, we had no idea who this person was. Now we've already narrowed it down somewhat, but this is really all that the database gives us. There's a person out there who's related to our unknown person. That's it. All of the rest of this that I'm going to show you is legwork. It is going through records, solving puzzles, trying to figure out who this person could be. So first we build back in time. We find that matches parents, grandparents, great grandparents, because we're looking for about a second cousin, so they should share great grandparents. Of course, family tree building can be difficult. People have immigrated from other countries where there aren't records. Uh, not every state has a public birth index. And just because a relationship is on paper doesn't mean it reflects the biology. But once we've built that family tree, now we need to build forward in time. So it's not that matches great grandfather who committed this crime, it's one of his second cousins. So now we need to find out who the second cousins are. So we have our family tree from back in time. Now we need to build forward in time. Those great grandparents, we need to find their other children, grandchildren, 
great grandchildren. Now we have a list of all of match number one's second cousins. And depending on the size of this family, this could be hundreds of people. But again, we've narrowed it down from the population of the Earth to all the just the second cousins of this match. Of course, again, things can be difficult when we have uh, biology that isn't reflected in on paper, but you know we're getting somewhere. And now we need to narrow down the possible identities. So of course, we know the sex of the subject. If it was a perpetrator, it's probably male. So we can throw out all the females. We know the date and location of the crime. So that person had to be of an appropriate age and they may have lived nearby, not necessarily. You know, we had a crime committed in Alaska where we found the guy in Maine, but you know, he may have lived nearby. And we can use some other information like uh, sharing between the matches, ancestry, phenotype, and we narrow it down to second cousins and we know they have to have blue eyes. Well, that can be really helpful as well. So I'm just gonna take you through uh, what triangulation means. If we have multiple matches in GEDmatch, so they all match the subject, but they don't match each other, they represent different branches of the subject's family tree. So think of your parents. You are closely related to both of your parents, but at least probably they are not closely related to each other. So they represent different branches of your family tree. So those are two family trees that have come together to produce you or triangulated. So what that looks like is we've built match number one's tree. Now we need to do it all again with a second match, building back in time and forward in time. And now we need to know is there a connection between these families? Currently, we have lists of people who are second cousins to match number one and who are second cousins to match number two. Well, if we're able to find a, a wedding, ideally a marriage certificate between someone from match number one and match number two's families, well, now the children of that marriage are second cousins to both match number one and match number two, whereas all of the other hundreds of people in this are only related to one or the other. So in case study number one, we'll see a nice triangulation. This was a homicide of a young couple in 1987 in Washington state. They drove down from Canada, bought a ticket for a ferry, and were never seen alive again. They had DNA from the crime scene. It never hit in a database and no leads, no witnesses, no information. So Cece, our lead genetic genealogist, she analyzed this. This was actually the first case that we did. Um, she analyzed this, found two matches who did not match each other, built their family trees and found that they connected. That match number one had a cousin who had married a cousin of match number two. So now the children of that marriage were at the right genetic distance to both. And that marriage, they only had one son. He was second cousins to match number one and half first cousins once removed to match number two. He had no connection to the crime. He lived in a rural area. He was a trucker and the cops were able to obtain uh, a cup from him and matched his DNA to that crime scene. And he is now the first person in the world to ever be convicted by a jury trial in a case involving genetic genealogy. In 1986, a young girl was murdered in Tacoma, Washington. And this was another one of our first study, first cases. You know, again, she had, there was DNA, but no matches. So here we had analyzed the DNA and found that this person, this perpetrator was about 90% Northern European and 10% Native American. So Cece found two matches in GEDmatch who had no DNA and in researching match number one's family, she found that a pair of brothers who were cousins to match number one lived in Tacoma in 1986 and were one eighth Native American, as we predicted. So this was very exciting, but they were not quite the white right relationship. They were one degree closer than they should have been given how much DNA they shared. And there was also no connection to match number two on paper. But what CC found in researching their families was that back in the 1930s, Match number one's relative and match number two's relative lived in the same small town in the year before match number one's relative's child was born. So what seems likely is that while one person was recorded as the father, it was actually what we call a non-paternity event uh, or misattributed paternity, where in fact, these cousins 
were half cousins to match number one and were cousins to match number two. So she was able to give this lead to the detectives. They matched one of those brothers to that crime scene sample and closed that case after 30 years. The last thing I wanna talk about is next generation sequencing data for forensics. So this is a really new thing, being able to actually sequence DNA rather than just looking at the STRs. So we can do a lot of typing in a single assay and get a lot more information about the alleles than just their length. We can also look at their sequence. And so the DOD's problem was that there are multiple different manufacturers coming out with these NGS systems for forensics, and they each have their own software. So if you analyze a sample in one software and someone else uses a different platform, then you can't compare the profiles to each other. So the DOD wanted a platform agnostic software system that can just read in any raw data and produce compatible profiles that can be compared, and also they can be expanded to new types of analysis. So we built what we call FX. Uh, it was originally called Keystone, now it's called FX. You can import the raw data and do lots and lots of different things. And we've built this for the DOD. So you, we're, we've added cat card access, it's compliant with the STIGs, you can do it locally or over the internet. And you know, it's currently its current cap level of capability. It can create STR profiles using length or sequence, can compare them. So this is a comparison between two individuals where uh, the DNA evidence has a 13 and a 14 allele, and the uh, reference individual has uh, two different 13 alleles with different like, different sequences. Uh, you can deconvolute mixtures using length or sequence alleles, get aligned sequence reads, get SNPs, do SNP comparisons, and for ancestry, predict phenotype, uh, mitochondrial DNA, mitochondrial matching, and even the snapshot capabilities, the ancestry, phenotype, kinship, uh, those, are, those are in there uh, in the DOD distribution. So that's now available at the DOD Forensic Labs. And the great thing is, since that platform is now there, it's easy to distribute new tools. So um, that kinship analysis of highly degraded DNA that I talked about, well, that's gonna be an FX plugin. Um, we're also giving them ancestry analysis. We're working on automated pedigree reconstruction, mixture decomposition, all sorts of things that can now easily be distributed to users in the DOD. So that I'm all done, <laughs> and if there are any questions, I'd love to answer them, and you feel free to contact me uh, afterwards if you would like to. Dr. Great Tech, thank you very much. That was uh, awesome. Uh, everybody, that's, that was a lot of material, and thank you for explaining it in a way that uh, even a Marine could understand it. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of uh, all service members for the work that your company is doing to identify the remains of our fallen soldiers and Marines, airmen, and sailors. Thank you for that. Um, we do have one question. Um, Gabrielle wants, uh, wants to know, um, are there any potential access limitations to the DNA phenotype while it is a predictive key feature for forensic reverse engineering for heuristic computational research for the future? Well, so we've been offering the phenotyping as a service. Um, let's see, databases, sorry. Um, so we've been offering it as a service. Uh, we have not been making the software. We've only been doing it for law enforcement. Um, and then the data that we use uh, comes from a variety of sources. We've been using data. A lot of it is publicly available. Um, you can get a lot of data from NIH. Uh, we've also conducted a lot of research studies to, to get our own data. So I guess I'm not entirely sure what access limitations you're asking about, but hopefully that covered uh, the question that you were trying to get answered. Well, and, and while you were answering that, Ellen, um, somebody asked if we could show slide 56 again, which is the genetic genealogy databases. Um, and you kind of mentioned who does it and who doesn't. And I think when you and I first initially began talking, that was one of the topics that came up on the when, when you all uh, worked with a uh, local radio station. Um, there's been a lot of change and a lot of churn in that about the legality and who's going to release and what the waivers are and that sort of thing. Would you care to expand on that? 
Yeah, absolutely. So GEDmatch was the original uh, public database. So it is not a DNA testing service. It's just a database that was designed for genealogists and you know, people whose family members were getting DNA tests, but they were getting them at different companies. So if one family member tested at 23andMe and another at Ancestry, they couldn't then put them together for comparison. But GEDmatch would allow you to upload both of them and then run comparisons. And so GEDmatch was the the uh, database that was originally used for the Golden State Killer investigation, that was not us. That was done surreptitiously without the knowledge of the GEDmatch users. But once that was done and there was so much press around it and the public response ended up being extraordinarily overwhelmingly positive, pretty much everyone agreed that getting that guy off the streets was a good thing. And so GEDmatch ended up embracing law enforcement usage, explicitly updating their terms of service so that uh, law enforcement usage was you know, explicitly covered and people had agreed to that. However, uh, about a year later, they decided that they wanted to be sure to protect their users. And so they added the option to opt in or opt out of law enforcement matching. However, the way they chose to do that was to opt everybody out and make them explicitly opt back in. So even though we found that the vast majority of people would uh, support law enforcement usage, many people don't know that they have to log into their account and actually change a setting in order to help. And so we get a lot of people asking, what can I do to help? And we say, just log in to GEDmatch and please opt into matching. Family Tree DNA then later decided to also allow law enforcement usage. They instead, everyone has opted in, but people can choose to opt out, uh, but they don't they they have a slightly different system. You can't just upload data directly. You have to um, go through their system and ask for uh, for them to upload it. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ellen, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. As we mentioned at the beginning of today's webinar, the slides in the recording of this presentation will be made available for download at our website, www.hdiac.org. If you're learning, interested in learning more about the HDIAC or in getting involved as a subject matter expert, as Alan has done for us, or if you'd like to present like you saw today, or you'd just like to expand your presence in our user community, please feel free to reach out directly using the contact information on the left-hand side of your screen. In addition to these monthly webinars, the HDIAC also offers monthly podcasts that span the range of our eight technical focus areas. We also put out a bi-weekly email digest with the latest scientific and technical news in the Homeland Defense community, as well as sponsoring a technical inquiry service with up to four free hours of technical consulting. If you're active in the Homeland Defense community and are interested in joining our subject matter expert community, please reach out directly. Our subject matter experts contribute in a variety of ways, including presenting webinars such as today's, providing podcasts, and consulting as needed on the technical inquiries that the HDIAC receives. Again, our contact information is included in the chat box on the left-hand side of the screen. Be sure to join the HDIAC for our next upcoming webinar, and thank you for your time today. Best regards, and stay well. Thank you again, Alan.